Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. This segment is brought to you by my company, Bull Realty. For customized asset and occupancy solutions, give me a call or visit bullrealty.com. Well, today we're going to talk about the office market, and uh, I think everyone's a little curious because we've been so long in this cycle. Uh, we've got rising construction costs, we have changes going on in the office market, we have uh, some trouble with co-working. So what's going on in the office market? We'll talk about it today. Please welcome my first guest. It's Michael Rossell. He's Director of U.S. Office Analytics with CoStar, and he's joining us on Zoom. Michael, thank you for being with us, sir. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you, and uh, it was another terrific year in the U.S. office market, so I'm excited to uh, speak with you about it. Yeah, and that, that's good to hear. So tell us about it. When you look at the U.S. office market overall, uh, is it performing well? Some people in the press would think would lead you to think that the office market's uh, not doing well. Yeah, despite uh, some of those stories that, that may be uh, generated for clickbait, uh, I think uh, the real story is that the office market continues to perform well. And uh, you know, I won't bury the lead here. Uh, it was a strong year in 2019 in terms of absorption, in terms of leasing activity, in terms of rental rate growth, as well as on the investment side. Um, so really a positive year. And, uh, and I think it really all begins, you can't talk about the office market without touching on the economy at least. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to say that many of the economic pundits uh, were certainly forced to move their predictions of the US recession in 2019. Uh, forward to 2020 and beyond. Uh, it was really a, a strong year in terms of job growth, uh, which translates into a, a positive tailwind um, for the office sector as well. You know, more than 2 million jobs are added in 2019. And I think when all is said and done, GDP growth should come in ending the year uh, right around 2%. Uh, so those were all positive, um, you know, factors in terms of, of helping the office market. You know, I will say if we want to look ahead, uh, the U.S. economy does appear to be poised for at least a soft landing, uh, probably not a sharp recession. Um, I think one could argue that the manufacturing sector is probably already in a recession, courtesy of tariffs and business uncertainty uh, surrounding trade policy. And I think despite longer term, uh, lower long term interest rates and reduced corporate taxes, we've definitely seen that CapEx has continued to slow. Uh, but I think the labor force continues to provide positive tailwinds to, to the economy in general. Uh, and I think we're starting to see the labor force participation rate of 25 to 54 year olds uh, increase a little bit. And that tells me there's still a lot of people on the sidelines that can re-enter uh, the job force if the job market continues to tighten. So those are all positive head, headwinds or tailwinds, I should say, uh, when we look at the economy and how it impacts the office market. And what about uh, rental rates, uh, Michael? Did you uh, see uh, some growth there uh, across the country? Yeah, we, we really have, um, you know, rent growth uh, did decelerate a bit towards year end. I think earlier in the year, we were seeing 3% plus uh, rent growth across the country, and it decelerated closer to, uh, to 2% by year end. Um, however, that did continue the longest stretch of consecutive positive rent growth on record. Wow. Uh, so even though the pace of growth uh, slowed down, uh, it's still been an unbelievable run, uh, and particularly for, uh, for landlords uh, in terms of rent growth. Um, you know, and I think really, obviously there were some winners and losers in terms of rent growth. Uh, primarily Sunbelt and tech markets posted the strongest uh, growth over the past year. I think markets like Charlotte, Jacksonville, Austin, Seattle, San Francisco, all ranked among the leaders in terms of rent growth. Uh, and even Philadelphia, which uh, is decidedly not a Sunbelt uh, market, uh, vacancies in Philly have been uh, near 20-year lows, and that's been driving a lot of the rent growth there. You know, conversely, I think you know, New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, continue to rank among the weakest rent growth uh, markets. And I think a lot of that has to do with the supply and the pipeline in those particular markets. Uh, New York and D.C., for example, have combined 37 million square feet of supply in the pipeline. So landlords may be a little bit hesitant there to aggressively boost rents. And what has that done to uh, the U.S. 
uh, vacancy uh, rate across the country for office? Yeah, well, as I alluded to at the top, uh, it was a strong year in terms of net absorption, uh, and that really helped uh, supply roughly matched absorption, and that uh, kept our vacancy rate right at around 9.7 percent at year end 2019, and that matches an expansion era low. Uh, so it's it really has been a continual steady decline in the vacancy rate uh, we've seen over the past decade. Uh, and absorption has a lot to do with that. And looking ahead into 2020, 2021, or at least the first half of 2020, uh, the leasing activity that we've recorded uh, definitely bodes well for absorption uh, through at least the first half of 2020. So it was a very strong year in 2019 in terms of leasing. And that should translate into uh, strong positive absorption through 2020. So I don't see the vacancy rate uh, changing any time in, in the next year or so. Uh, dramatically uh, upward. Well, that's good news. And you, know, you mentioned New York and D.C. is having a good bit of new supply. But when you look at new supply levels, Michael, across the country, um, mm -hmm. how does it compare to, you know, historically, it seems like there's less office uh, really being built these days. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think we're still playing uh, catch up to to a large degree around the country and even in the most active markets around the country, uh, Austin and Nashville, for example, uh, the new supply there is still less than 8% of total stock. Uh, even in a market like New York, uh, which is seeing close to 20, has close to 25 million square feet of space under construction, uh, that really only represents about 2% of total supply just due to the sheer size of the market there. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really is a mixed bag uh, in terms of construction. I think the areas of the country that have uh, seen the best population and job growth have seen and will likely continue to see the most supply. Um, San Francisco, for one, has about 7 million square feet underway. And again, that counts for less than 4% of total supply. And unfortunately, I think in a market like San Francisco, I don't think that 7 million square feet is really going to do a lot to help out tenants who are looking for space. Uh, it's been a, a unique phenomenon in San Francisco where several major tenants, including Salesforce and Pinterest, have actually pre-leased space in buildings prior to those buildings receiving development approval. Mm. So the appetite for space among tech firms growing and expanding in, in the Bay Area just continues to be insatiable. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a little bit of a shakeup in the co-working world. Uh, from your desk, uh, what do you see? What's the impact there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it, it's hard to uh, talk about the office market in 2019 without mentioning uh, WeWork, certainly, and co-working in general. Uh, I would think it's safe to say that uh, one tenant that probably won't be taking more space in 2020 is WeWork. Uh, they signed for about 8 million square feet in 2019, um, and I, I don't see that happening again. Uh, I think they have a lot of commitments underway. It wouldn't be a huge surprise to say that, you know, maybe they won't uh, uh, fill all of those commitments uh, when all is said and done. Uh, but the, the positive news is uh, it, it's really more of an isolated effect. It's not really going to impact the U.S. market as a whole uh, in an overly negative manner. You know, outside of a couple of markets, New York, maybe Seattle, San Francisco, that have a higher exposure to WeWork, uh, they'll feel it a little more. Uh, but even in those markets, we're talking you know, less than uh, less than 10 percent of, uh, of the total space in the market is, is occupied by co-working firms. So uh, it's more of a localized impact uh, to landlords that may have particularly high exposure to co-working firms and particularly we work that may feel it rather than a ripple effect throughout the entire U.S. office market. OK. We talk with Michael Rosal. He is director of U.S. office analytics with CoStar. And Michael. Um, when you look at the market overall and you look at the performance uh, rates and occupancy, and, and uh, do you see anything different between the A-class properties and, and kind of the rest of the market? Yeah, absolutely. I would say uh, the unique phenomenon in the last couple of years is that virtually all of the demand uh, throughout the country has been in those four- and five-star Class A properties. That really accounts for the overwhelming bulk um, of absorption throughout the country. And that's something that's uh, definitely been a major shift throughout uh, this expansion. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, what's driving that uh, is the ultra tight labor market throughout the country. And we've heard it time and time again, but it rings true still. Uh, there is a premium 
on recruiting and retaining top talent uh, and a sub 4% unemployment rate, uh, it's imperative that you hold on to the talent you have. And if you want to expand your company, you need to offer something uh, that the, that the uh, firm next door doesn't. So having uh, that uh, trophy quality type space in a building that's just chock full of amenities, the latest amenities has become really important for these firms. Uh, and, and especially over the last few years, uh, a firm space uh, and branding has been uh, interrelated. So kind of how they want to brand themselves, not only to their employees, but to the public has become more intricately tied into the space that they occupy. So it's very important for firms um, and particularly large firms. Um, at the end of the day, uh, real estate is one of the smaller expenses for large firms. Uh, the overwhelming majority uh, of the expense comes from uh, their employees' salaries. Uh, so at the end of the day, space is relatively cheap uh, and people are very expensive. Uh, so I think having that top quality space has become paramount. Yeah, I'm going to give you an amen on that. I mean, you know, uh, you know I, I think office users have, have figured it out that uh, their space can be a real attribute um, to their business, especially when it comes to recruiting and retention. Well, Michael, when you look ahead uh, at the office market moving forward, what about this, this class B or these, what, two and three uh, star type of, of properties, as you guys uh, call them, uh, as rents rise and can, have continued to rise, uh, across the country. Are there some opportunities in these uh, B properties, if you will, or are there any uh, opportunities maybe in some of these closer in suburban? What do you see as opportunities out there? Yeah, I think definitely there's uh, there are opportunities. Uh, if you look carefully, uh, I think some of those older class B, uh, you know, three-star suburban properties uh, can be repositioned. Uh, I think if you're in a well-located suburban area, almost more of an ex-urban feel where it has some sort of live, work, play environment and some sort of retail amenities for your employees. Uh, I think if, if you were well capitalized and could add um, some amenities, uh, certainly not to the level that we see in, the, in downtown trophy towers, but uh, if you could upgrade the amenities that you have, renovate the space, bring in more natural light, um, uh, you know, I, I think there are opportunities there. Uh, for really uh, deep suburban assets uh, that don't have great connectivity to, uh, to major freeways or public transportation, uh, uh, you know, those 1980s vintage uh, deep suburban assets, uh, you know, I don't know if the highest and best use any longer for those is, is remaining uh, office stock. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a good point. Uh, some of those properties may be hard to get to. It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how those uh, perform moving forward. Well, we're going to take a short break and when we get back, I want to ask Michael about the investment market, about cap rates and, uh, and values moving forward. So stay with us. I'm Michael Bull. This is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. Appreciate the show? Consider referring business or doing business with our sponsors. Bull Realty is a commercial real estate sales, leasing, and advisory firm doing business throughout the Southeast, headquartered in Atlanta. Visit bullrealty.com for more information. Commercial Agent Success Strategies provides video training for commercial agents. This training gets five-star reviews from even the most experienced brokers. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. You're invited to connect with us on your favorite social media. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Don't miss a show of special interest to you. Be sure and subscribe to the show on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. And at the show website, CREshow.com, you can subscribe for a weekly email announcing the show topic and guest. While you're there, you also found more videos and podcasts. Thank you for watching or listening to America's Commercial Real Estate Show.